Good morning and happy Friday. Um, I hope everybody is getting ready for the heat wave. I went to the store last night and got ice and it was like the second to last um, bag at the old store. So it's gonna be one of those Pacific Northwest fan shortages, ice shortages. Um, we're gonna get started with the land acknowledgement. Carolina's gonna do it this morning. So I'll give it over to Carolina. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to start with the land acknowledgement. The WICSAP office is physically in Olympia and the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically with the Nisqually and Squaxin Island peoples. Olympia and the South Puget Sound region are covered by the Treaty of Medicine Creek signed under the rest in 1854. Who are the original people of the land you are on today? We are guests on this land and with humility and reverence, we set the tone of our training with this fact at the forefront of our minds. And I just want to add um, for us for us to also um, be aware that in this country, we have many other tribes also from America, from, and I mean the continent, um, that many times we don't even acknowledge. Um, they, they are also part of our communities, but they are here and it is extremely important for us to always think, you know, uh, and be inclusive, think that um, or at least, you know, um, acknowledge who lives in your community, who is seeking for services. I am from Guatemala, and in my country, there are many tribes, and um, many of them are here. And so I know by fact that in my country, um, indigenous uh, communities are still uh, very much discriminated, and if you are indigenous, that means, you know, you are at the very bottom, um, you are uneducated, you are poor, you are, um, you, you have no rights, you know, and so they are discriminated back home and they continue to be discriminated here. And it is why we have to think inclusive and we have to acknowledge their presence here in our communities too. And when we serve, we should provide services for all, not only some, not only those who speak Spanish. And so, yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you, gracias, Carolina. Okay, we're gonna do um, our check-in this morning and breakout session. So I'm going to just to get us um, networking and meeting one another just a little bit more as we start out in this journey over this career or volunteer work or whatever it is that we're doing, um, that we're meeting other people. Uh, so I'm gonna put some breakout rooms together here. So just go around and introduce yourself, where you're gonna be working or where will you be working or are working, volunteering, and just share you know, your favorite way to relax. I'm gonna open up the breakout room. Police. 
This is Katie. Um, what's your cat's name? Hey, his name is Bubba and he is like 19 pounds of snuggle and he just has to be like in my face or anytime I'm on Zoom, it's like he immediately goes straight to the computer. I, sorry, I'm a cat mom too. So I was just like, I need to know what that boy's name is. <laughs> Yeah, Welcome can. back, everybody. We're in the main lot. session now. Kids and cat butts, that's what Zoom's like now. <laughs> I love it. It is what it is, right? This is Patricia. We're making the best of it. So next is what is on your mind and in your heart? So we're checking in. Um, we were going to do this in last session on Wednesday, which was session five, but there's just so much content and discussion that it got pushed to this, which is fine. We uh, really uh, want to remain fluid, right? We don't want to rush this process. So um, this space right now, it's a space for apprehensions and questions. And um, so we're opening it up to the group. You can put what you want to put in the chat or you can unmute yourself and speak. Just we ask for the interpreters and for all of us that you say your name first before you start speaking to the group. So I'm gonna go backwards. This week, uh, this session, session six is medical advocacy. Wednesday, uh, session five was crisis intervention and suicide. Session four was advocacy skill building. Session three, dynamics of sexual violence. Session two, confidentiality and ethics. And session one was role of an advocate. That is a lot. Each of those <laughs> by themselves is a lot. So how are you feeling? Um, what's feeling hard? You can just reflect on these questions that I'm asking. And you know, if you have a journal or something to write on, you can write how you're feeling on, the, on that, in that journal too. What do you have questions about? What are you feeling apprehension around? And for me, I can tell you when I first, um, became a crisis advocate, sexual assault advocate in Seattle, I was so concerned about saying the wrong thing. And we had a really intensive training through Seattle Rape Relief, but it's still, you know, it's not the real thing. It's not in real time. And so I was so scared to say the wrong thing. And that was in 1994. And one thing you know that we were trained not to do is ask if they had called the police because um, that is a real leading question. <laughs> it's too direct, and we don't want to bring up the police unless they bring up the police because even though um, we have whatever feelings we have about the police, maybe we have family members who are poor police, etc., on and on. We have good experiences, we have bad experiences. We don't want to um, influence a survivor in anything like that. And so, um, and a perp the perpetrator could have been a police officer. We don't know, it could be anybody. So that's what I was afraid of, basically saying the wrong thing. So if you'd like to add anything to the chat, or if you have any questions, about the topics we've covered so far, please do. This is the time to do that. I was afraid of getting a child sexual abuse call. That's intense. That's intense. And you know, when you're talking about child advocacy, it's, it's a whole nother layer 
because they're so, you know, they can be so young and they have so many years of lived experience, which isn't that many years of lived experience. And any, any um, survivor, we don't want to add to their harm and their trauma. But with a child, you really want to make sure, especially if it's been something that's been reported and they're going to have an interview with the police and that they're going to be involved with systems, you really want to work on building that relationship before they go in, into, into an interview with um, a detective or the police. Because that relationship with you um, as their advocate, they're really, you know, at their tender age, they're really going to be relying on you to advocate for them. And if the interview is too intense to call a timeout and get some fresh air, get some water, um, if the person interviewing is being intimidating, not okay, not okay. So it's up to the advocate to be that per, uh, child's eyes and ears. Well, and any survivor, it just, again, you know, when it's a child, I understand the anxiousness about it. Some other things here in the chat, <clears throat> a lot of it reflecting that kind of um, that on the theme of like not wanting to say the wrong thing, being afraid to do or say the wrong thing. Yeah, that seems to be what's coming up here. Strong feelings about the police and I'm nervous about letting those feelings get in the way if I'm asked to work with police or survivor. Yeah. Mm hmm yeah, worried about the unknown, Barbara, yeah. Mm -hmm. Worried about systems medical advocacy. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, so maybe that will feel better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, getting the support you need about around being a new advocate uh, through WICSAP, Check out our web page. You've got our email um, through your agency, wherever you're volunteering or working. Um, yeah, there is support for you also in your role. All right. Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. I muted myself and I've got the next one. So we're gonna jump into medical advocacy. What makes a medical appointment uncomfortable? What makes it comfortable? What actions, environment, anything you can think of? And you can use the chat box or annotate or unmute yourself to respond. And so, what makes a medical appointment uncomfortable or what makes a medical appointment comfortable? Uncomfortable when the appointment is hurried, yes. Mm -hmm. Not knowing who to ask for not knowing who to ask for the right information mm -hmm. when you are not sure what to expect during an appointment whoa it's going fast stains can take a very long time and can be invasive would be uncomfortable for a survivor yes and i'm sorry what i said is going fast is the chat when the doctor or nurse touches me without my consent comfortable can be when you are well-trained and able to access information needed. Uncomfortable when they ignore what you are saying. When medical professionals use language that you aren't familiar with, medical terminology, that can be scary.
uncomfortable when your concerns are overlooked because of race, gender, etc. Comfortable when there is kindness present and true care shown for the patient. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing in the chat. And again, if anybody would like to unmute themselves and add something, please do. Comfortable when the same nurse gives reasoning to why they would be performing certain examination and or why they ask or have to ask certain questions. Definitely. Comfortable when I have support during appointments. Uncomfortable when you don't speak the language. Another one could be when you don't have documentation they need and you're afraid they're going to ask you about resident documentation for the United States. Comfortable when not rushed. Right, being rushed is such a huge thing in our current medical systems whether or not it's a crisis situation or just a regular appointment, right? I got 15 minutes to just take care of you as a whole bodied person, right? That's weird. Comfortable when the doctor slash nurse is same gender and or ethnicity sometimes, in parentheses, sometimes. Hi, this is Maria. Yes. Yeah. And I just wanted to say that one of the main things that I've come across is since my parent, my parents predominantly speak Spanish, they understand English very well. But with some certain um, words or when sometimes they have issues communicating well with the doctor. And so that's always very uncomfortable and they always have to go around about looking for interpreters or seeing when we have time off or if we're able to take with go with them or any of the appointments just because it's a lot easier for them to take us than for them to look for an interpreter or they the it's a lot more comfortable for them as well and it's a lot easier for the doctors as well but um now from what i know a lot of the hospitals are trying to use um like interpreting machines in the hospitals and places that way but um from my experience my mom about be pre-covid she was in the hospital for a while and they tried using those big machines those interpreting machines but they never worked so it was always very uncomfortable for my mom if i wasn't there or anybody else that she knew or even if they had they had to be looking for other people to come in and interpret for her and make it easier for everybody so it's just a lot more hassle if she didn't bring somebody with her that way they could interpret for her and have the doctor there as well and kind of go back and forth that way with us so it's just something ongoing that's always happened and that we also also sometimes have to be translating as well the documentation as Patricia has mentioned because most of the time well not always but occasionally we had the the chat the opportunity like the visits where it's only in English, English and it's a little bit harder with terminology to explain. So I'm at, um, instead of having to explain the terminology, I'm gonna have to explain kind of the concept so they understand kind of what disability or what I'm trying to get forth with to see if they've had that previous illness or not. And it's a little bit harder on me as well because obviously I'm not, I don't know all the terminology either so it's kind of also hard on me as well, as well as her. So it just makes everything a little bit harder.
Thank you, Maria. So we make this list because for us to do advocacy is about empathy, right? It's about self-awareness, it's about knowing what to expect, right? And so we create these lists together based on each other's experiences, our diversity of experience, to start to think about all the possibilities and all the different things to consider that makes something uncomfortable versus comfortable so that we can be um, part of making things more comfortable or advocating for more comfort with survivors we're working with. Patricia, you're muted somehow. <clears throat> Carolina, it's you. Okay, great. So the next slide is medical advocacy um, encompasses more than advocacy at a hospital during a rape exam. What other situations may call for medical advocacy that you can think of? If, if, you, um, if you can think of any, please um, share in the chat. Um, what are some advocacy techniques and approaches to medical advocacy in all its settings? Um, again, the... Um, Rape exam is not the only appointment where we can go with the survivor. Um, our advocacy um, many times our connections to the resources can benefit the survivor um, by even making those phone calls, by um, reaching out to the to the right resources, finding the interpreters. So. Um, let me see the chat. Rosemary says injuries from physical assault, like burns or broken bones. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yes, that is correct. Um, yeah, and um, often. This takes a lot of a lot of time too. You know, as the advocate, um, you would need a, a lot of time to to spend um, when you are working with a client who doesn't speak English or doesn't um, is not literate. Um, you would have to, you know, um, in we don't when you are bilingual. Um, you are doing double the work. You know, um, in your office, you might not. Um, have to reach out to an interpreter or a translator even to help your client, you would have to, you know, um, explain what that means. And even uh, when I say it's a lot of work, um, I mean, the survivor can be in the appointment, whether this is a Planned Parenthood, um, at the sexual assault clinic, um, in, you know, different settings, um, different offices, but when I mean it's a lot of work, I mean, um, you know, the, the person can be explaining to the survivor um, the process and all the paperwork, and all this process is just so overwhelming. The client goes home with so many papers, so many forms, so many follow-ups, and so you are the one to go to you know, um, where the client can go and ask, what does this mean again? Can you please help me fill out this form? Can you please um, explain what this is? I don't even know who to call. Um, I don't even know what the clinic said to follow up. Sometimes when a child has the forensic exam, um, they tell the parent to follow up with the medical doctor for any um, appointments. And so, uh, then the parent, besides, you know, uh, besides of the of the uh, rape exam, 
And now they have to follow up with a dentist if um, if they need if they need to, or they need to um, follow up with with um, with a doctor for you know just different or get labs done. And so this process can be very overwhelming. Um, I have here in the notes, dental appointments are commonly very challenging for survivors of sexual assault, reproductive care, abortion, pregnancy, STDs, STD testing, whether directly related to the assault or not, um, help finding a doctor. But as, as an advocate and my experience, I can tell you that um, when you are working with someone who is not literate, who you know, doesn't speak the language, um, it will take the double the work and you just need um, a lot of patience. You need food in your belly because you might get hungry, you might get frustrated um, when you have to repeat things, you know, over and over to, to that survivor and, and, and it's okay, you know, take care of yourself. Take a five minute break, 10 minute break, whatever you need um, and, and just, you know, be there with the survivor because it, it, it's a lot more than just here, have this phone number, you call and you follow up. They're going to come back to you with many other paperwork, phone numbers. They are overwhelmed. They, like I said, they don't know where to begin. And so you are a trusted resource where they're going to choose to go to. Lots of good things here in the chat. Benny says helping help finding therapists through the health insurance, right? Like navigating how to get medical help without it showing up on the insurance. If the client is under their parents' insurance and doesn't want their parents to find out, so kind of thinking through that, that's a great one. Um, Faith asks if rape exam <clears throat> is rape exam the terminology we generally use, not forensic collection or something like that. Um, yeah, we usually use yeah. Um, sexual assault nurse examination or a sexual assault forensic exam. Um, rape exam is a little more, yeah, it's a little older. We've had this core training forever. <laughs> so oh, we can definitely update that slide, but yeah, forensic exams. Um, we provide, uh, oh, Hansel says we provide medical advocacy at our program for our program participants, helping schedule appointments. Um, medical facilities are not required to provide interpreters for administrative tasks like scheduling appointments. Um, but if non-English speakers can't even do that, how is that equitable? So we started doing some policy advocacy around this. Yeah, this medical advocacy is not just with individual people, right? It's it's with um, with the systems to help improve them for all the survivors that will come later, right? So yeah, great. And Robin says, um, do not get a disclosure of abuse in the forensic interview because the nurses can ask more direct questions than a forensic and be more thorough than a forensic interviewer. Um, oh, and Katie asked, would we provide medical advocacy for survivors if pregnancy results from an assault, like helping them explore their options? Yes, 100%, absolutely, we would do that. Great. Everybody already knows all the things, which is what we love. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. This is Patricia. This next slide, we're going to be unpacking, normalizing, safety planning, accompanying, researching in the context of medical advocacy. So the first one, validating and normalizing, the first advocacy bullet point. How can you validate and normalize these survivors? Advocates play a huge role in validating and normalizing the experiences of sexual assault survivors to help fight isolation and lead to more self-knowledge and empowerment-based decision-making. How can you validate and normalize these two scenarios on the PowerPoint? The first one, a survivor is avoidant of going to their initial checkup with a new primary care provider. 
And again, you can note in the chat or um, unmute yourself if you have something to share. You In the next scenario, you accompany a survivor to a doctor's appointment and they have increased anxiety and fear as they check in with the medical staff. We can let survivors know that it is common to avoid doctor's appointments, medical appointments, or feel a lot of fear slash stress during exam and prior to them, procedures, interacting with medical staff, or even just making an appointment. And some of you have shared in the chat regarding experiences you've had. How do you, oh, that's Michelle, thank you, Michelle. So what do you think? How can we validate, normalize the survivor is avoidant of going to their initial checkup with a new primary care provider? And how would we know the survivor's avoidance because they shared that information with us in their meeting with us? And we could say something like, can you tell me more about that? Open-ended questions, not yes, no questions. Unpacking what's going on in their mind and in their heart. Offering to accompany them. Asking them what kind of support they would need from from you as their advocate. Letting them know it, it is a normal reaction, what they're feeling because of what they just experienced. Others have felt it. Maria says can help them take small steps to get to the main goal, which is the appointment. Yes. Thanks, Michelle. In quotation, yeah, not wanting to go to a new doctor is normal. A lot of survivors don't like going to the doctor. Rachel says, Naming that after losing autonomy of their body, it is hard to give that up again, especially with a brand new practitioner. And that often doctors aren't trauma informed. Very true. Yeah, so we're just normalizing and validating, saying, yep, that's exactly normal um, to feel that way because doctors are going to talk about your body and touch your body, and that feels hard, right? That makes sense. So um, let's talk about what happens next. We're building on our skills to do medical advocacy, starting with validating and normalizing. And then talking next about safety planning. So <clears throat> during, an appoint during appointments, as advocates, we can help to create those personalized um, kind of emotional safety plans together as we do. Um, as we know, trauma-informed care is about collaboration. You know, the advocate and the survivor working together to create something that works, right, for that survivor. So that they have some kind of structure in place to support them in their medical settings. So um, one of our greatest resources is creating safety, helping a survivor create that plan for any future healthcare experiences. So let's brainstorm this particular scenario, okay? A survivor you're working with is worried that she will be triggered at an upcoming gynecologist appointment. How can you safety plan with this survivor? use the chat box or um, 
asked to um, yeah, unmute and, and speak. So think about that. What are ways we can safety plan? Hi, this is Rosemary. Yes. I had an idea for this. I mean, I'm a survivor myself and I've had times that I remember personally being um, uncomfortable in the office and not being able to verbalize when I wanted to say no or what things that were uncomfortable to me. And I thought maybe it would be an interesting technique to use to have a client use um, a nonverbal form of communication for the, to the client, maybe a hand signal or just to look at them um, when they're starting to feel uncomfortable and a time where the advocate can then step in and say, hey, can we just wait a minute? Or can we you know, pause on this so that it doesn't escalate to a point when the client is so uncomfortable and they're lacking the verbalization to communicate and it becomes a really hard situation for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. What else? Hey, this is Faith. I, um, I had something similar with one of my clients one time uh, where a lot of the normalization was it's really hard to say no to a medical professional because that's right. not something we're taught to do. Um, so we brainstormed ways that we could signal that we wanted stuff to stop without saying things like stop or no. Um, and what we ended up coming up with was saying the nurse's name felt much more comfortable. Um, and so we, we went with that. The nurse was the one who told the doctor that's what we were doing so that they didn't have to really like explain that to a medical professional. Cause again, like we're not taught to have opinions around medical professionals. Yeah. And so a lot of that was just naming that like really bare basic, um, not like lack of autonomy and you just like ability to say no or stop. Great, Faith, thank you so much. Um, absolutely, building on what Rosemarie said too. And then Benny also says here in the chat, help the survivor come up with a way they would feel comfortable asking the gynecologist to be slow and clear, sharing what they're doing during each step of the appointment. So that could look like, um, right, working with the survivor and the doctor to kind of maybe be the liaison between the two saying, let's have an appointment where we don't do the exam, but just talk about what the exam is going to be. Or that um, we have a phone call or just have, you know, some time set aside in the beginning to say, here's all the things I'm going to do, right? And then just to ask, you know, part of our plan is to say, hey, you know, if you're going to touch me, um, just say, I'm going to touch you now, or, or something like that, that we're planning, right? Um, and then Rachel says, um, sometimes going through what happens at, a, at an appointment in advance, a mental rehearsal, right? So that they know where the hardest parts are for them, and you can come up with strategies to cope. One of the things that just as a, someone who, who also has to get gynecological exams, um, I know that they can say they're going to touch me, and they, I still jump when they do. <laughs> and it's not even one of the things that's as most um, triggering for me as a survivor. It's never been something that that bothered me in that way. But still, when just somebody touches you, you just on your thigh, you're like, Ugh! <laughs> right? It's just a natural thing that happens. So I think that's also something to normalize as well, right? Um, Faith says, yeah, can we bring fidget toys or something to help you stay grounded in that moment? Sure, something to hold on to. Um, helping them feel good about, um, helping them feel good and safe and encouraged to say what it is that they need. Um, because even if, um, even if it's just to say, I need you to, to just tell me when you're going to touch me, because then we're starting to work on those consent muscles and build back our choices, right, that we need to do when we're survivors. Marissa says, bringing something of comfort to the appointment. Yeah, exactly. Just like um, what Faith says here as well. So great. Yes, great ideas. And this can be true, you know, like Carolina said, dentist, dental appointments 
are really um, the thing that I found very surprising when starting to do this work and how hard that is for a lot of survivors. Um, and, you know, I don't know the exact reason, um, but it, it is very challenging for survivors and been asked to accompany survivors to dental appointments or to work with them on that as well. So uh, reproductive um, uh, appointments and dental appointments were always kind of my biggest, the biggest places where, where I found myself doing the most medical advocacy outside of forensic exams. Thank you, Marissa. Being on your back, not being able to talk. Mm -hmm. Barbara said, uh, experience it safely first to so drive to the area in advance. Um, or in my situation of court prep, went to watch the prosecutor or judge. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about legal advocacy on Monday, we're gonna talk about that as well, right? All of these skills are the same. We just use them in these different settings, right? Like medical settings and legal settings and all of those things. We take our core advocacy um, kind of skills and apply it in all the different scenarios of um, making people feel prepared, helping them exercise choice, knowing what to expect. Um, dental appointments clients often feel more enclosed having somebody standing over you. Yeah, great, awesome. Yeah, and for everybody, it's gonna be different about what it is that bothers, right? That is hard, so great, great job, everyone. Oh yeah, thank you, Rachel. Carolina? Yes. Advocacy skill accompanying. As advocates, we can also offer support by attending a medical exam with a survivor. And again, we can't say it enough. Um, our presence as, as advocates as, um, as a superb person means a lot to the survivor. Let's brainstorm. What kinds of appointments might you advocate to accompany a survivor? As advocates, we can also offer support by attending a medical exam with a survivor. Attending a medical appointment with a survivor can be as simple as accompanying the survivor in the appointment or in the waiting room. In the event that an in-person accompaniment is not required or available, many survivors find it helpful to book it a triggering experience with a call to their local advocacy organization. And as an advocate, I remember um, the clinic always checking in with the client first. If this was um, uh, a family that needed to go uh, for a child's um, forensic exam, they always check with the family, in this case with the parent, um, is this okay? Do you want to have an advocate here? And um, it's from, you know, this organization and this is what, this is their role. And, you know, I am part of the Latinx community. So um, many times, you know, we know each other in the community. And if the client says, no, you don't, I, I know this person, I don't want them to be there. And that's okay you know, that's okay, it's their choice. And uh, maybe another advocate is available, um, if not from your organization, from another organization, if that is the case. But um, like Michelle said before, it should be their choice. And, you know, we don't have to take it personal. Thank you. What, what kind of appointments may you advocate to accompany as survivors? If you can use the chat. And um, I want to mention too that I witnessed many times when um, the clinic, detectives, police officers, they try to use the advocate as the interpreter just because it's easier. 
it means less work for them, less you know, effort, or you are bilingual, hey, you know, why don't you do it? But it's, it is really not our job to be the interpreter. Um, they have the funds to provide the interpreter. And so um, our role is to be the advocate. And, you know, it's extremely difficult. Um, that was one of my, not mistakes, but I had to learn the hard way. I did it um, once for a client and it was very difficult. Um, I, you know, they put me on the spot and I didn't know whether to say yes or no. And so I did it. Um, and I know it's like wearing two hats. You know, we are there to support the client. Uh, but, and, and what we can do is uh, make sure that there is an interpreter schedule for, for that client. Sometimes there will be the need for two interpreters. If, this, if the child is a survivor, the child may need uh, an interpreter and the parent. And I've been told by law enforcement, well, we don't have the funds to you know, provide an interpreter for the parent, only for the survivor. And that is wrong, that is incorrect. <laughs> it just, they don't wanna take the time to, to schedule one, but our job is to remind remind them often um, what language, make sure that you also take notes of the region of the language, uh, because sometimes it could be tricky, um, what is it, low and high, alto, bajo, um, it could be mom from Guatemala, um, and it's a different mom language, depending on the region, and then you know, it takes forever to schedule these appointments. And once um, it's the day off, you find out that it was the wrong interpreter. So we need to pay attention to those details. And the clinic law enforcement will appreciate that work from you as the applicant. Thank you, Carolina. And so what else might you need to research as you provide medical advocacy for a survivor? We can help survivors look into their options for individualized medical care they need by assisting with the research. But what else might we need to research as advocates as we provide medical advocacy for our client, the survivor? You can use the chat or you can unmute yourself. financial assistance, being aware of their culture, may or may not be available to do certain things, transportation, job options, perhaps referrals to recommend for RO attorney or counseling, how immigration status may affect access to medical services, Thank you all for sharing in the chat. Different medical persons in places that are more careful in caring for survivors and those that are not. Immigration status and legal options for work. Transportation options. Support group, child care,
which clinics have language accessibility. And you know, if they're receiving funds, certain funds, they, that's part they have to have the language access for everyone. If it is a new doctor researching like what the doctor looks like, finding a photo to help know what to expect, summer programs for children, finding providers that have the same identities as the survivor so the survivor can feel more comfortable, safe, disability services, Great, great suggestions and comments in the chat. Quickly, Sam, may I add? Yes, please do, Carolina. Someone mentioned the transportation, and that is a big one for many survivors, um, especially in the rural areas. Um, even learning how to um, ride the bus, uh, which bus, and a lot of times um, the appointments are, well, we are here in Olympia, but um, when I used to work in, in Shelton in Mason County, um, even um, driving from, um, from Shelton to Olympia, it, it's only like 20 minutes away, but there was no ride. And you have to brainstorm with that client and see you know, all the possibilities to make, to, to make it to those appointments because if they don't, then law enforcement thinks, oh, they're not, they're not willing to protect their child. They not, they don't want to come to these appointments, and so um, even just going on the bus with them and telling them, you know, giving them directions, um, it means a lot. Or yeah. or ask car. What I used to say is, you know, can you get a ride uh, with someone, and I will give them a gas card. So that could be a payment for the person who provided the ride. Thank you all for sharing. And Carolina, great feedback. And now we're going to have a stretch break. We can do, what time is it right now? 10.31. So let's come back at, oh, now it's 10.32. Let's come back at um, 10.40. Let's take about eight minutes um, and stretch. Like the little puppy here, walk around, go outside, use the restroom, get some water. Okay, see you back. Okay, welcome back. Now we're going to move to medical legal exam advocacy, uh, kind of where the <clears throat> medical and legal systems collide. Oh, sorry, I'm stepping on your slide, Catalina. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, this is a long one, so. Okay. Hospital advocacy. Follow your organization's protocols, be timely, explain your role, advocate for an interpreter. We can't say it enough. Um, if needed, explain what to expect. Know that the victim has a right to have a support person present during the exam, but it might not be you. What to do if you are asked to stay in the room for the exit. Okay. Um, and 
um, as you see here, we we have the you know advocate for an interpreter, and you may get tired of me repeating this, but um, it just happens so often that we need to pay attention to to this. Um, I had a case where a child was used as the interpreter. Um, this child was, I believe, nine or ten, and then he was um, subpoenaed to go to court and be a witness. And so, and the parent didn't even know, you know, that this child had been used as an interpreter by the by law enforcement. And so the family received the, um, the subpoena in the mail and they didn't even know what it was. They, they didn't know what it said. It was in English. And so they brought it to our office and, and we explained what it was. And so then we were all trying to find out, you know, what, how the law was protecting this child and what his rights were. Um, but, you know, it's going to happen if law enforcement doesn't, you know, have the right training. Um, if we can advocate and do our best to, to, to make sure that, that they do their job, you know, provide the interpreter. I also watched an interview um, of a detective interviewing a survivor who spoke mom, which is an indigenous language from, from Guatemala. And in the interview, um, well, actually the detective showed up at her house and say and said, okay, um, all I could find was a Spanish interpreter. Um, so, and she said, but I speak mom. She said, yo hablo mom. You know, her Spanish was very limited. And, and the detective didn't care. He said, oh, well, you know, just do your best. And he didn't care. And he, he had the interview in front of his mother, her mother, um, her daughter, um, a young child, five years old. And one of the questions that I could not get out of my head, you know, after watching this interview was, how did you feel after you were assaulted? And because the survivor, um, you know, didn't understand the question, she said, bien, which is good, you know. Um, and so that was recorded and that was used um, in, the, in the legal process. And so when I came to, to be the advocate for this family, it was, I think about a year later. And so um, what I can say is this case made it to the attorney general, um, but um, let's see. So this is one good example that I always like to use um, because it, you know, it is just the extreme when, when, um, when they, when we don't, uh, we are not aware or um, these interviews and these processes take place with that super person without that advocate who can, even if we don't speak the language, if I don't speak mom, you know, I can help that survivor with the right interpreter. Um, but going back to the hospital advocacy. When you're on call, go to the hospital when notified by victim, hospital staff, or police. Be timely. The victim may have been waiting a while or already started the exam. Eat something before you leave the house. Bring a snack. However, make sure you don't eat in front of the survivor. The survivor may not be able to, to eat while that um, process takes place, the, the forensic exam. Also bring a book or something to do. Um, you going to be, expect to be there at least for a few hours in the, in the waiting room um, for this appointment. Or, I'm sorry, it's not an appointment for this um, advocacy that you will be doing with the survivor. But you expect to be there for a while. Introduce yourself to, to the victim and identify yourself as an advocate. Explain what your role is. Obtain permission from the victim to stay and support them through the process. Celebrate a survivor's decision to decline your presence. It is not about you. 
and it shows that the survivor feels empowered to make decisions when a huge decision was just taken away from them. This is a positive step in the healing process. If an interpreter is needed, be sure to advocate for one. Children and or relatives are not appropriate interpreters for many reasons. Some of the key reasons are that private information needs to be protected and medical terminology needs to be accurately translated. Act as an attentive and supportive listener. If the victim wants to talk, do not elicit information regarding the crime. Explain to the victim why medical care is important and what medical procedures to expect. Remain with the victim until the, do until the doctor or sexual assault nurse, examiner, forensic examiner, safe, sane, arrives for the medical examination. The victim has the right to have a support person present, whether or not there is a support person, support person present or who that support person is, is up to the victim. Ask the victim if they wish for you to remain in the room during the medical examination for emotional support. Be prepared to be asked to leave. If you are asked to leave, offer other forms of assistance, checking after medical examinations, give them a call in a few days. Be sensitive to cultural or religious concerns that the victim may have when discussing pregnancy. Put your own biases aside. Have change for vending machines or bring snacks for the victim to eat after the medical exam. The hospital may provide something for the survivor to eat because talking to some, taking some medications on an empty stomach may cause nausea. Only offer food to the survivor after getting an okay from medical staff. If possible, provide the victim with a set of clean clothes in a few toiletries after the exam. The, victim, the victim's clothes will be taken as evidence. Some hospitals allow rape crisis centers to store these kids in or near the exam room. Try to get a good understanding about their value systems. Different cultures and communities will have different values about expressing pain, what respect means, and dealing with medical personnel. One way to provide effective hospital advocacy is to assess from the victim what their concerns are and what they hope to get out of the procedure. Common concerns are pregnancy, injuries, and sexually transmitted infections. We will be covering those concerns in more detail. However, your job is not to interview the victim or get involved in the investigation. Whatever information you may need for your intake paperwork will likely be obtained just from listening to the victim. Talk to the sexual assault nurse, examiner, and or police. Another important thing you will need to do is practice appropriate body language. Although, how, although you might not see a lot of blood or injuries, it is possible. You will certainly be hearing some really difficult information and stories. Your reaction is crucial. Should you finish? Should you flinch? vomit, pass out, etc. You may lose the respect and trust of the victim and the hospital staff. Explain the importance of follow-up healthcare and supply victims with information about appropriate health care clinics. Advise the victim that additional services are available from the organization. Ask the victim for a phone number and indicate that you will call them in a few days to check in. If the victim gives you permission to call them, be sure and ask how to identify yourself over the phone and if it is safe to leave a message. This is a very difficult process for the survivor. 
and for you as the advocate. So self-care is also extremely important. And it is okay to debrief with your supervisor or your coworkers. Thank you, Carolina. Patricia. Thank you, Carolina. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Advocates role at the hospital. Role consists of information resource, an information resource answering questions and explaining medical procedures, follow-up testing, possible future concerns, and crime reporting, and possibly any information that survivor may have a question about. Active listener, helping the victim sort through and identify feelings and concerns. A resource identifier, assisting the victim in thinking about those people in her or his life that could be a support. And I just want to reiterate from the last time, they may have nobody but the community sexual assault program. So just reaffirming with them that you have a 24 seven crisis line and you're not on it all the time, but there will be somebody there to answer the call. Um, mindful presence and a representative. Um, a resource identifier. We, I'm sorry about that. I said that already. A reality tester. Letting the victim know their reactions are normal what may happen in the near future, and dispelling the myths and misconceptions they may have. A representative of the Rape Crisis Center, a person that will be there whenever and whatever the need is. When a victim chooses to go to the hospital, it's a very difficult time. The victim will most likely be upset, scared, and anxious. Your role is to help the victim feel as comfortable as possible and to prepare the victim for what will happen. It's important that you become very familiar with the steps that a victim goes through so that you can prepare survivors who are considering going to the hospital or to support the survivor who has already arrived at the hospital. And as I shared previously, you never know what you're going to be walking into when you open that door or that curtain to go back with the survivor. And for me, I, you know, one of the students I worked with in the a middle school English language learner program was there with her parents. So you, you just never know, in small communities especially, you never know. And so make sure as um, was stated before by Carolina and Michelle, you're hydrated, you're grounded, you've done your conscientious breathing, and you can help them feel better and relax a, a little bit more. Um, and keep that eye contact with them. It's really important. That's one way of showing through our body language that you're there, you're connected with them. So things you'll need to know are the check-in process at the hospital, where to take or meet the uh, victim, who to talk to, evidence collection procedures, crime reporting options and outcomes. Can I add something, Patricia? Please do. Yeah, um, so in your syllabus, there's a couple of things um, that will help kind of um, um, provide more context to the conversation that we're having. So if you haven't already watched the SANE video from Harborview, um, that's in your syllabus. You'll need to watch that. Uh, and that will walk through. It's a role play of what it's like to show up at the hospital, um, a real um, advocates and SANE nurses uh, in the video talking about that process. 
it's also part of your syllabus is at the bottom, you know, to that highly recommended that you do a tour of the hospital um, to be able to go there and kind of see so that the first time that you show up, you're not lost. Uh, Cause that's definitely what happened to me. Um, uh, emergency departments can be so maze-like <laughs> or just hospitals in general where, you know, who to talk to, all of that stuff. So you want to go over there and kind of walk through that um, or have another advocate or your supervisor take you over and show you around uh, for like a little tour. Where's the bathroom? That's really important, <laughs> right? Where's the bathroom? Where do they keep the blankets? Um, you know, I got really familiar after a time and um, I would just go and get snacks or the 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 package that has the clothes in it for them afterwards just to help out the stained nurse and also just to kind of um, it's it can be a really long process you can be there for hours so you just want to be uh, able to be as helpful as possible um, and try and find things so that you're just not sitting around and another thing too is just where you're sitting when the exam is taking place I always sit next to their head to their face um, so they have privacy if I am asked to stay during the exam. And that a lot of times what I do is have pretty casual conversations um, with survivors. I always talk about my pets, things that are kind of lighter um, as kind of a distraction or a conversation if folks want to kind of get into that. I also try and find those things that I feel really comfortable about talking. Um, so pets are always a good thing for me because it's it's not a boundary problem. I'm not giving a lot of personal information about myself. People usually like talking about dogs or cats or whatever. So um, just kind of thinking about those kind of things ahead of time is also really a helpful thing. So those are, those are kind of my kind of tips from my experience. And getting comfortable with quiet if you're not comfortable mm -hmm. with silence. It's good practice to become comfortable with the silence and stay present. Carolina? I'm sorry, I'm so into it. I'm just listening to you both. Um, okay, after the exam, how is the survivor leaving the hospital? Do they have a safe place to go? Do they need prescriptions, change of clothes? The advocate may, the advocate may help sort through fears about leaving, check in about support system, provide referrals, give crime victim compensation information, set a follow-up, make sure SDI EC info was provided. After the exam, the victim may change clothes, give instructions and get prescriptions. Be sure written instructions are received since they are under extreme emotional stress. They may forget verbal instructions. There may be difficulties in leaving the hospital the victim may be afraid to leave or may have no transportation or even a place to go. So arrangements to go to a shelter may be needed. There may be feelings of grief and loss. At this time, you as the advocate need to help the victim sort through fears about leaving, check to see what support uh, base they can now turn to inform client of available and accessible support systems in the community which may be needed. Make sure they know about crime victim compensation. Um, and it was done in, at the time of the of the procedure too of the when they were in the hospital. Um, you don't want the, the victim to um, end up with a bill from disappointment. Set up a follow-up call appointment and 
two, three weeks if they want. Make sure you find out if it is okay to identify yourself when you call and to leave a message. Also provide resources on sexually transmitted infections, emergency contraception, a safe place for the big victim to go, advocacy services available, try not to overwhelm the survivor, be sensitive to the process they just went through. Don't be surprised if they forget who you are uh, when you call them to follow up. And um, yeah, the, you, you always wanna follow up. Um, and if the client seems that they are um, dealing with this and, and they feel okay and you, they seem to not be open so much to um, continue to receive services from you, it's okay. Um, you know, they, they, they will know where to go if they need the support. They, they will come back to you if they need additional support. Thank you, Carol. I'm gonna talk a little bit about medical advocacy with children um, because this is often, um, I know at our agency, there are only a few people who were authorized to go to do medical advocacy with children, but every community is different. Um, so it's good for everybody to kind of be prepared for what that looks like um, because I don't know what it is like in your particular community. Um, but children are often taken to either the emergency department, like most adults, or a child advocacy center, which is uh, has wraparound services, where it's all kind of a, a one-stop place so that everything can kind of be done all at the same time. And they're usually scheduled. They're not usually taken in an emergent situation, like the middle of the night, like an adult might be. Uh, they wait, they schedule appointments, they don't try to hurry it through that window of 96 hours um, like they do with adults. Part of that is because it's normal for, for these exams to be normal, meaning that there's no findings. Um, so the dynamics of working with a child can be really different than with working with an adult. Um, that's a really hard thing for a parent, right? For, their, for them to take their child to an examination, um, which are generally a lot like um, a child's regular pedi pediatric examination. They try hardly ever to do um, anything invasive. Um, so they will look really different than, than a sexual assault exam with, a, um, with an adult. You, most likely will not be in the room when the child is getting any kind of forensic exam, especially if it's invasive. They have a lot of extra technology like scopes and things where they can look in without having to insert anything or things like that. So uh, it, they try to make it as similar to a child's re re regular medical exam as they are able to. Um, it's really best practice to have an advocate that's working with the child and, and a separate one for the parent, uh, especially to have them, if they're not able to be in the room with the child, to, to just be able to sit and kind of talk about what that's like. To be able to, to kind of tell them what to expect, like, you know, it's really normal for there not to be finding. And that a lot has to do with the nature of what child sexual abuse often looks like, um, that things aren't, aren't found, uh, evidence is not collected in that same way. And so that's normal. And to validate, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I think that's the key point for us as advocates working on that those child sexual abuse forensic exams because it's normal. Then the parents are like, well, how do I know if this happened? Especially if they're already really struggling with it's someone they know, it's someone they love who did this to their child. You know, so, so navigating that as an advocate can be just that really important place um, for us to kind of reassure them around that medical experience. Um, reassure them that it's very seldom something's gonna be inserted into a child's body, um, that it's gonna be a normal 
uh, meaning no findings um, exam. So besides documenting like the history, the health status and the injuries associated with the, the uh, child sexual abuse um, and identifying any potential evidence, uh, the exam is important to assure the child themselves that they're physically okay. Um, so it's almost even like additionally like this emotional safety kind of process, right? Um, that going to the doctor can be a process in which you know you're okay, you're fine, your your body is all good, um, and that's that can be a really important thing with children because it's hard to understand the nuances of the abuse that that's been happening. Um, so that can also be a really important part of that process. Um, so again, only about 20% of children have actual medical findings that indicate child sexual abuse or assault. This does not mean it didn't happen and we need to be ready to normalize and validate that for children and caregivers. Now, when we talk about teens, it's more similar to adults. Most teens are taken in emergency department and not as many taken to things to, to like a child advocate. Um, um, so it's a little bit about what's what are the needs of this particular teen, how the report come about, kind of on where it gets funneled to. Um, So it's very similar to an adult exam if you're preparing more. Um, there's the confidentiality. Michelle, you're breaking up and freezing. Your screen is freezing. This is Patricia. This is Barbara. Thank you for saying something. I didn't know if it was just mine, my headset or not. Thank you. You're welcome. So, can you hear us, Michelle? Oh. Okay. So, Michelle has lost her internet and she will be back with us momentarily. Is there anything you, as um, Advocacy Corp participants, would like to share from your experiences of medical advocacy? and going along with what Michelle was sharing in the last two PowerPoints. She was on Teams. It looks like she's back. But please share in the chat if you have anything. <laughs> Technology, maybe not. You can also unmute yourself if you would like to share any of your experiences with medical I'm, advocacy. There I'm she is. I'm so sorry. Hey, what are you gonna happened? do? Yeah, <laughs> just gonna be fluid and go with it. I know my internet went went down and my phone was also like on cell data. I'm like, what happened? Um, Mercury is not even retrograde anymore. Okay, so sorry. You were doing, you were leading something, Patricia. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I, I was on mute. I asked them to uh, share in the chat if they have any um, experiences they would like to share with the group regarding medical advocacy, and they're Great. doing that. Oh, cool. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and that you would get back to the medical advocacy with teams when I'm they here. get back on. Okay. So um, I was talking about mandatory reporting, I think, when it dropped out. Um, these are similar to adult exams. Um, trying to figure out Mandatory reporting is a ch the most challenging place I find with teens. One, because they don't want you to make a report. Usually um, their parents might not know or be involved. Um, they can consent to their own medical services, so they might not even be there. Um, mandatory reporting is often about our children being protected. And sometimes, parents bring their teens in for medical exams, make police reports 
uh, when it's like a older partner. So we see things like um, maybe it's a 16 year old girl with a 21 year old boyfriend. So technically that is sexual assault, but they are not interested in identifying it that way, uh, the teen, um, or they're not interested in doing any kind of report. That's the most challenging for me of any sexual assault exam uh, across the spectrum is that particular situation for me. Um, and so it's good to know that, that uh, adolescents are not provided any sexual assault exams without their consent unless it's an absolute life-threatening emergency and in those cases that it, it is not generally. Uh, so parents cannot force teens to, to, to do that. They might be really uh, into trying to make that happen. This is another great opportunity for there to be two advocates, one that's working with the parent to say, I see that you are incredibly frustrated with this situation. Having a teen is so hard. A teen who is having sex with somebody who is much older than them is absolutely illegal. You are correct. Um, let's talk about what we can do so that she feels safe, you are feeling okay, knowing that this exam can't take place without her consent and that it shouldn't. We want to help to reinforce the choice of that teen. Um, talking about those power dynamics that are happening between a 16 and a 21 year old, right? With the parent saying, yeah, you're right. This is concerning. This is illegal. There are power dynamics in play. And also like she's, you know, we're balancing that with this 16 year old who's wanting to make choices, right? 16 year olds can consent to sex. They cannot consent to sex with 21 year old. So it gets really, you know, kind of in the weeds when you start looking at laws like that. Those laws, of course, are in your um, online training, but the, the main point is not for us to know exactly those pieces of what's legal and illegal, but to understand those power dynamics that it could be coming into play, working with the teen and the parent on those kind of things, um, letting them know about what they have control over and what they don't, right? That reports are probably, if they brought them to the hospital, if they reported it to the police, then that's the kind of thing um, that is already gonna be reported. You don't have a mandatory report kind of a thing. CPS is not gonna take these kind of a case because they're being protected, it's going to be a police report. Um, so, and the parents likely already done that if you've come into that particular scenario. Confidentiality is another really interesting place because youth are able to, especially youth that are 13 and up, but really any youth, if the law is not clear, um, so, are, but they are able to consent to services, uh, being advocacy services and also medical services. And it's very specific around 13 and up for reproductive services. So it could fall into a number of different places. So there are um, considerations under the Healthcare Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, but we wanna do the same kind of things as support the teen through the exam, regardless of what the scenario is, if they've consented to it. Discuss options around STIs and pregnancy, um, birth control, if that's something they want to talk about, or emergency contraception. Maintain, you know, whatever paperwork or, or kind of things that you want to give to them or, or that you need to collect for your agency. And offer that follow-up, right? Um, and you can follow up as that teen's advocate. It's a, kind of a more clear place as an advocate for a teen. They have more autonomy. They have more understanding about what's happening. Um, you're able to kind of do more than with a, with a younger child where you're going to probably be more involved with the parents and, and dependent on the parents for that work together. So. Um, Matt yeah, Lynn is, Lynn is saying I'd like to add just a... Yes, hi, please go Lynn. ahead. I would like to add um, to what Rachel is saying in the chat box. It's uh, often not enough 
just in the training of the issue of transgender or non-binary uh, and all the other marginalized groups. Um, so, I mean, it, and it's, it, and that population is coming up more often in our work mm -hmm. these days. So I, it, certainly more than it used to be. And I think that we all need to be aware of that also. So I wanted to thank Rachel for bringing that, that those points up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, absolutely. The different kinds of, uh, I mean, we, we see parents who are so supportive of certain aspects of their child's experience or gender identities, uh, uh, um, sexual orientations, their response around sexual violence, and we see it the other way as well. Sometimes we see, and I've had this, this case where um, the parent was very supportive uh, and very just P flag all the way and very supportive of their child's transgender identity, but would not believe that sexual abuse had happened to them. So sometimes you see that in the reverse as well. You just don't know where, uh, what those dynamics are gonna be. And so being able to kind of help kind of shift or pivot to whichever place that the kind of parent needs support around, right? So thank you all for that. Um, okay, Patricia. Supporting non-offending parents and caregivers, or caregiver. Verify who the survivor wants present during the exam. Many people may accompany the survivor to the hospital. It's important for the advocate to know who the victim wants with them at the forensic exam or medical assessment. Um, the victim will have enough stress getting through the medical procedures and they don't need ad additional interactions that may impact their coping ability. Um, privately check in with any loved one. Additionally, the victim may censor what they say because of the friend slash family member who is also in the room. The teen or adult victim needs to be in control of when and how family and friends are told. So we're not gonna make assumptions, right? Um, we're gonna validate their emotions. The significant other, um, maybe a parent, a lover, a partner, husband, sibling, roommate, friend, employer, or teacher. This person will influence the recovery process. This person could re uh, influence the recovery process in either a positive or a negative way. Significant others, as well as victims, need to be counseled and supported. Another advocate may need to be called to the hospital to support the significant others while you are with the victim. Um, it's really important to, I think I mentioned already, validate their emotions, navigate adultist beliefs together. Remember confidentiality is still key. Know, know who your client is. You must maintain confidentiality for whomever you are an advocate for. Be cautious that the significant other may be the perpetrator. An example is a man who has just beaten and raped his daughter may take her to the hospital. And again, um, if you have any experiences you'd like to share regarding this kind of advocacy or questions, you can always do that in the chat. Yeah, that's, and that's an intense scenario. It's not super likely, but it's definitely a possibility, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move into some role plays and I'm going to, um, I'm going to exit out of this for a second so that I can find you the Dropbox. Make sure it is the absolute correct link. Now I feel 
sketch. Okay. There's a question. There's a question in the Go chat, ahead. Michelle. Mm -hmm. You saw it. Is it appropriate to ask if we can have a private conversation? Yes. Mm -hmm. and absolutely. Um, with either one, especially if you have two people, if you have two advocates. That is awesome because the other advocate can distract the parent, <laughs> right? <laughs> to kind of you know so that everybody is being supported in that. Um, Okay, I am going to do the, this link here. I'm going to click the link just to make sure that's real. These are your three role plays. You are in groups of two or three. Um, so use this sheet to go through and do role plays. If you have three people, one person is the observer. Um, and I'm going to try to make it so most of them are three so that everybody kind of gets a turn. And I'm opening the rooms. I might make a couple of adjustments. But make sure and turn your camera on if you're able to and unmute so that everybody is participating and can see each other. Okay, we're going to take the about 25 minutes. Carolina, you're doing a great job explaining all of this. Welcome back, everyone. Nice to see everybody's faces. Oh. 
Okay. So anything that came up or that you want to share from the role play questions that are unanswered or, you know, the person that you were role playing with had some really good answers or things that you liked. Um, so let's, um, yeah, let's hear back from you for the next few minutes. Hi, Michelle. This is Maria. Hey, Maria. Um, my question is, in my group, we were talking about the last scenario with Ziva, mm -hmm. where the police officer was being super dismissive, and she wasn't even sure how the police officer was called. It didn't either really say or it didn't come up either way. But we were just wondering if once the police were, were called and she didn't want nothing to do with them, would it be possible to um, relieve the officer of his duty and just tell me, you know what, the, the um, victim, the survivor doesn't feel comfortable with you or doesn't feel, or she doesn't want the police involved at all? Would they be able to leave or does she have to give them some type of interview or do they have to be there? Like, what's the protocol on them? Somebody, anybody in this, or well, in this specific scenario, somebody calling the police and then her not being comfortable with that mm -hmm. specific person or just the police department in general. How would we, how could we go about that? Mm -hmm. Thanks Maria for that question. That's a great question. Um, so usually what I do when I'm in this situation, which happens on occasion, usually they don't call the police unless somebody wants to, but sometimes the police were called by somebody else um, and then show up at the hospital, um, you know, just due to miscommunication or something. A lot of times survivors don't quite know if they want to report yet or not. <clears throat> so what I would do in that situation as her advocate, I always want the choice to be hers, in this case, hers anyway, with Ziva to say, I would turn to her and say, okay, so you've said to me that you, you know, that you're not sure about wanting to report, um, you know, maybe what we can do is just maybe you can give, <clears throat> I would say to the police, maybe you can give her the card and then she can call you later if, if, if need be. And, you know, just trying to kind to kind of broach the topic and see, you know, and then I would also say to her, you know, you don't have to report this right now or ever if you don't want to, and maybe having some time to think about that would be helpful. I would also tell the officer too that, you know, that if people can have a little bit of space, uh, sometimes they might feel like they want to report. So if you give her some space, it might actually be to your benefit. You know, just try to kind of, you know, get them out of there without having it be, you know, a whole big thing. And then we can figure it out later, right? Leave your card, you know, and she'll be in touch or something like that, right? So yeah, I would try to do something like that. Does that answer your question, Maria? Yes, we just weren't really sure how to go about telling the mm -hmm. officer that she wasn't comfortable mm -hmm. with him, especially if she's just antagonizing her. Hey, what really happened? I don't mm -hmm. necessarily believe you, but what really happened? That's also another good reason to get the card too, is that if it's, if she wants to like talk to his supervisor or something, then she has the card and knows who it was. So okay. I'm always just kind of like, oh, do you have a card? Like, you know, why don't you leave it with us? And, you know, let's, let's see if some space might change her mind about reporting. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, like, and then I would also tell her, you know, once he's gone, you know, you don't have to do anything you don't want to. You get to think about this. You said you don't want to do that. And that's fine. Right. So, okay. yeah. Uh, If a survivor, oh, Allison's asking, if a survivor decides not to go through with the SANE exam, can we bag their clothes for investigative purposes? If they want to, um, but generally if somebody doesn't want an exam, um, they don't probably wanna give their clothes up either. They're probably just trying to get out of there. Um, it's also not the evidence that's the most useful either. Um, what I would suggest um, is that if a survivor is like, I don't want an exam and you're talking to them and you're not at the hospital uh, or if you're at the hospital say, okay. So if you change your mind, here's, you know, you can put your clothes in a, in a plastic bag and just kind of leave them there uh, for if you decide. Um, you know, there's other things too, if you wanna wait um, 
and you think like in a couple hours you might want to, then you know you won't want to take a shower, or brush your teeth, or do anything like that, where you'll destroy the evidence. Most people are not going to want to do that. They are going to want to wait. They're going to want to take a shower because it feels terrible to not take a shower um, for a lot of people after this. So um, yeah, clothes. You know, I mean, they could, but it's not really um, super. It's not. It's not as helpful as you might think. Um, Kyle is asking, what's the dynamic or challenge if a male advocate is with a female survivor during a medical scenario? I'd imagine a survivor would want advocates, nurses, doctors, the same gender as hers. Sometimes, and sometimes not. I think the best thing to do is to um, just acknowledge that um, about what is the, maybe the elephant in the room if you're coming in being like, hey, I'm a man, but I'm also um, an advocate. I can be here if you want or not. Like, you know, just being upfront with and, and making sure they know they can make a choice about that. It really, in my experience, I worked with a lot of advocates who are many, lots of different genders, non-binary folks, trans folks, um, male cisgender folks, um, and we all did hospital response. Um, and it generally didn't come up but the male survivor that, I mean, the male um, advocate that I worked with, mostly he had the most challenges when it was over the phone. People would hear his voice and be like, no, or hang up or just be like, can I talk to a woman? And it didn't come up as much for him when he was going to the hospital. Um, you know, there are different things too, where you probably are less likely to be in the room during the exam, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't be in the waiting room waiting afterwards or you know what I mean like there are still the things that you can do and that we respect if somebody is like yeah a guy can't be here so what's our backup plan around that right because everybody has those kind of things you know nurses are all kinds of genders doctors are all kinds of genders so are advocates and that's the reality we, we do what we can to do what we can to make somebody comfortable but also like sometimes that availability is not there. And so what can we do to kind of navigate that? Like, hey, I don't have to be in here during your exam, but I wanna make sure you feel supported. And so I'll hang out here and you can talk to me afterwards if you want, um, you know, those kind of things. But if somebody is like, yeah, you can't be here. I, I'm not trying to talk to you at all. Then that's fine. You can you can go or you can offer, hey, would you like it if maybe a female advocate called you later or something like that to, to offer. So that's, that's kind of what my experience is in, but it's not as it's not been as common as you as I assumed when I was um, working with so many different advocates of different genders and responding to the hospital. Um, Alyssa said, I, I found myself saying I understand and I didn't even realize it. Yeah, Jen uh, Lynn suggested I watch Brene Brown's TED Talks, learning about showing empathy, and I'm really excited to check that out. Yeah, she she has one video where it's like the animals are all in a hole or something. Is that the one, Lynn? Where they're talking about empathy. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I was reading, Karen, get caught up in the chat. Okay. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, I was asking about which TED Talk, if it was the, the and she has that animated video where the, all the animals are in the hole about empathy. Is that the one? Maybe I'm. Right, yes. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I'll, pull, I'll pull that up and share that with folks. Yeah, that, that is a, that's a really good one. Um, yes, yeah. yes, it is. We are really socialized to say, I understand. I was watching the news yesterday um, about the, the building that collapsed and the, the um, reporter was like, yeah, I can imagine. I'm like, but can you, you know, <laughs> it's like, I'm always thinking about how we, how we say things like, yeah, I can imagine or I understand. Um, and instead, kind of shifting it a little bit to be like, yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. Of course you would feel that way. Um, I hear things, you. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. A, a lot of different kind of just kind of shifting it a little bit to be what is more honest, right? Then I understand. 
right? We're socialized to say it, it's a thing, right? And, and it's not necessarily what we mean is that I understand, but it's, it's, we're trying to be validating. So that makes a lot of sense that, that you're using that, that you're defaulting to that. And that's why we practice together. So we can be like, oh, this is a thing that I keep doing. <laughs> Sometimes I do say it when I'm working with a survivor and say, I understand. And then, then, I, and then I, I'll catch myself and say, you know what, I said I understand, but you know what, I can't understand. And so let me rephrase that. Because sometimes those things do come out like automatically. So Alyssa, thank you for sharing that. And, and Lynn, that's a great suggestion. Um, Benny, I was told in the past that plastic bags shouldn't be used for DNA because they can contaminate DNA. Is that true? Um, I don't know if that's true. I imagine different bags might have stuff in them already if you have them around your house. If somebody doesn't want an exam, anything that they do is gonna impact the DNA. You can suggest some other things like, hey, you can set it aside and see if it's useful later on. And saying it's not gonna be in a chain of evidence or anything, so for sure it could be contaminated. Any, that's why, you know, there's been this recent thing where people are trying to use these at home testing kits, uh, which are just not appropriate, right? So there's just a lot of things like that, that it's like, what can you do that's like, it, it's almost like harm reduction. Like, okay, you don't wanna do this. You could try putting your clothes in this plastic bag and then just like, you can bring it with you if you do decide later on. It's not gonna be, you know, it's not, it's not the best, but it's something if you wanna try that. So that's kind of what I mean, Benny, about that. Mm -hmm. Hansel, yeah, um, pa they use paper bags in um, in the actual SANE exams. Mm -hmm. They use paper. If they're damp or wet, they need to dry, yeah, or they need to be frozen. None of us are forensic scientists. Survivors are not forensic scientists. It's best to have them do it. So if somebody doesn't want to get a forensic exam, they're not gonna really be able to hold on to their forensic evidence. They're just not. It's just not gonna be as accurate. And so there's things they can try to do, throw something in the freezer, put a thing in a bag, bring it with them later um, and see if it's useful but nothing is gonna be as good as an actual forensic exam. And, and I think that's what's important that we communicate with folks. Uh, faces I found one of the best things I did for myself was allowing myself to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. We're all going to say the wrong thing to survivors sometimes and being able to acknowledge that you said the wrong thing and recover that report afterwards is more important. 100% Faith, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, sometimes I catch myself saying, Thing, that thing that kind of comes to you automatically, right? So appreciate that. So basically, bottom line, forensic exams are done by forensic professionals, right? We are not those people. Survivors are not those people. So let's, um, uh, if somebody wants to maintain their forensic uh, evidence, they should get a forensic exam as soon as possible. You 100% can get a SANE exam without reporting the police, you can do it anonymously and those kits get stored for like 22 years or something. It's a newer law, um, so I don't know exactly what it is, but I have it somewhere in, in, your, in your syllabus, in the folders, there's something in there. Um, so it's like 22 years, I guess. So you can change your mind at any time. And then that DNA is just stored. In so, the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. In the chat, Lynn said, be kind to yourself. I just yeah. love that. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. So yeah, so that's the bottom line there. So um, we are at time for today. Please stick around if you have any questions. And on Monday, we're going to talk about legal advocacy um, and talk about all these same skills. We're going to do a lot of role playing. So make sure you've done your um, the criminal um, and different legal aspects of the online learning before um, Monday, just to help you be best prepared for the role plays that we're gonna do, okay? 
And stick around if you have any questions. Uh, especially you, Faith. I got to do a thing with you. <clears throat> I'm stopping the recording. <clears throat>